I must put that on your. Would you like, um, um, Councillor Tate? Would you like my pillow? No, I just it leans <laughs> back really. Councillor Tate, you would can... you like my pillow? No, that's exactly I would like to why I. About it. That's, that's, that's why I have the pillow. I think yours is further back. I don't think you're touching. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you can adjust yeah. them. That you can you can bring it up, Councillor Tate, <laughs> on the side. You can tip it. Tip it. There we go. That better? Weird, um, no, thank you. I just want to complain about it. <laughs> okay. I just oh, want oh, solutions. Because do you, want you, want you don't want solutions. So <laughs> this is why I have the pink pillow. Okay. <laughs> I have another one. I just want solutions. Oh, there we go. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is why I have a pillow. Sometimes I just do that to freak out Fine until we get to the eighth hour. <laughs> what the? I'll have to put it all in. Oh. Okay. I think we've, we've almost fixed the chair issue here in, in City Hall today. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Tuesday, April 25th Committee of the Whole uh, meeting being held here in Council Chambers. I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order, and I'll start with the land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the official territory of the Tanaha, the Silix, and the Sinix people, and is home to the Métis and many diverse ab Aboriginal persons. We honor their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. I would also like to have us turn our thoughts for a moment to the 40 unmarked children's graves found at the formal at the former site of the St. Augustine's Residential School in Seashells and that the, Sh the, Shishali, the Shishali Nation, we are um, sending our support and our condolences. So, thank you. Introduction of late items. Does anybody have a late item? Seeing none. Okay, moving on to item four. Adoption of the agenda moved by Councillor Woodward. Seconded by Councillor Pinero. All those in favor, oppose, and that carries. There's no minutes from previous meetings. Um, the city manager um, is absent today, but I will just check in with the chief financial officer. Mr. Jury, anything? Um, yeah, I uh, on the finance perspective you know we just did our five-year financial plan so I maybe want to just take a quick second and you'd mentioned Mayor Morrison at the um, end of the first session here but I did want to thank all the departments and everything for all of their hard work and it's, it was a long process but they've been fantastic to work with and um, really strive to try and sharpen the pencil where they can and find areas where we can save and creative solutions to issues and they've um, really done an excellent job and so I think it's a budget we can all be proud of um, and uh, yeah and as a special thanks to our deputy CFO she did quite a lot of work there as well so thank you thank you um, anything from uh, corporate okay and just uh, to uh, complete some thoughts there on um, Mr. Jury's report is so our final reading of the budget uh, will be on May the 9th and then towards the end of May, beginning of June, um, tax notices uh, will be uh, uh, sent out to a mailbox near you. So um, moving on to item, did anybody have any questions for the um, Chief Financial Officer? No. Okay. Moving on to item seven on today's agenda. Council reports. I think everybody's been pretty busy, and so I'm going to start with Councillor Woodward. Yeah, I just I wanted to mention that uh, we attended the AKBLG, um, which is uh, the local govern municipal government municipal and um, regional government um, convention. Uh, and, and then the, the next step from this is the UBCM, which happens in September in Vancouver. Um, so the, the byline for this, uh, this year's uh, convention was stand, standing strong together. Um, and it was, uh, I thought it was a really fascinating experience. Um, I've been to a few of them. Um, this was in Cranbrook this time, and 
uh, I would say uh, one of the most impactful things I experienced on, on this was the Tanaha Nation uh, tour of the uh, St. Eugene's former residential school, um, which is now um, a very large hotel, golf course, and all the money that generated there goes into that community. And uh, we were, we had a tour, our group had a tour, and um, we also saw a documentary about the history of that building, which was incredibly powerful, and many tears were shed in, the, in that room about what, what happened there over six, 60 years, uh, ending uh, in the 90s, I think. Is that correct? I, I would say it's pretty close to when they started the renovation for the Renovations, yeah. So it was, it was a derelict building for a long time. And then the 90s, the renovations began. And um, if, yeah, if you ever have a chance uh, to visit it, it's a really powerful place. Um, they have uh, like museum rooms, and you can see all kinds of uh, artifacts. Um, and yeah, I found it to be uh, quite, a, quite a powerful experience. Uh, and yeah, the whole, the whole event was, uh, was great. I think it was really good to see everyone again. There actually was, a, they did a, a, a show of hands of new uh, elected officials, and it was quite substantial. I would say maybe a third of the people that were there were brand new elected folks. Um, so lots of new energy coming into local government. And uh, yeah, a lot of the speakers were talking about yeah. sort of how do we move past the sort of divisive uh, situation we're in. Um, a lot of like uh, uh, misunderstandings and people um, uh, not uh, being able to communicate with each other properly. So they were talking a lot about how in chambers like this and in government and, and government organizations that we can try to lead basically with kindness and love uh, rather than divisiveness. So that's kind of what I came out of that uh, this conference with. Um, yeah, not reacting so quickly and uh, absorbing information and thinking about it and uh, trying to find bridges rather than burning them. So it was, a, it was a great conference. Really appreciated it. Anything else, Council Forward? No, that's, uh, that, was, uh, that, was, that was three days uh, last weekend. Super. Councillor Payne. Um, I, too, went to the Association for Kootenai Boundary Uh, the town and citizens of Cranbrook for hosting us. They did showing us many of the highlights of their community. Uh, the opportunity to ne network with other uh, municipal leaders, whether they're the elected leaders or corporate. Uh, I think there were corporate officers as well as chief, as well as city managers. There was really um, what I enjoy of that experience because. Uh, stronger together and collaboration is a significant uh, pillar of how I see us moving forward really successfully, not only in our region but throughout the province. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Councillor Page um, as being, um, as acclaimed. continuing on, I didn't want to say acclaimed, <laughs> as continuing on as in his role of the president of the association and the leadership that he brings to that part of which was planning um, in my opinion just an excellent conference the the um, presentations were thought-provoking the opportunities to learn new things were um, vast and deep and I believe a very valuable experience for everyone who attended and I know we'll carry those uh, relationships forward as we move through the next few years. So that was the big event. I do just want to uh, mention one other thing. I had the honor of um, attending the Honor House tour at the Legion, which I, you know, as council members of council, we get invited to a number of different community events. And if I'm available, I try to go because I 
pretty curious to find out what segments, segments of the community that I'm not super familiar with are doing. And I did have an opportunity to learn lots about the Legion, which you can join now as a citizen. You can drop in any time, not being a member, and just enjoy the facilities. And the um, Honor House presentation, Honor House is a facility in New West, uh, where I'm going to say um, individuals in uniform, because it's branched out beyond the armed forces to paramedics and um, other service groups can either stay while they're receiving some sort of care, whether that's physical or psychological care, or their families can stay there. So it just seemed like a, a brilliant, they, they called it I, uh, the Ronald McDonald House for um, uniformed individuals, and they've recently bought and refurbished a ranch in, and I'm going to get this wrong. Ashcroft. Thank you. <laughs> Where they, they offer similar services, and they had a number, they had a video with a number of, um, testimonials of people who had been there and had not only the physical but the psychological healing from a lot of the trauma that incurs that, that that can happen from being in uniform so i'm really glad that i took advantage of that um invitation and an opportunity to get out in the community i might drop back into the legion now and again just for a beer because it's on my way home from town <laughs> and they're a friendly bunch of people so check it out and the, they did uh they were part of the big renovation that happened there so the space is much brighter airier and more welcoming if you haven't been in there lately it's worth stopping in just to check it out those were sort of the highlights there's lots of other stuff but Councillor panero do you have anything any reports on, you know, would you like to hear about if there's any updates on our athletes here locally that are in the boxing community? And I would take the opportunity to, to, to share because I think that there's, that those are those exciting things that you get to. Right. Special interests at its finest here. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, just continuing on, but we do have two local, local youth that are, um, that have the opportunity to travel to Montreal later this in May and uh, try out for the national team ahead of continental championships in Cali, Colombia, and so that sort of represents the you know the big the big world out there, and it's really just great to see two um, homegrown athletes in in that position, and um, I'm also maybe going to be selected. I'm lucky to coach that team that goes to Columbia also. So those are that's my yeah my counselor update on my personal life. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think it's great. I mean, I, I just think it would be fantastic to be able to bring in one of your athletes who wins a medal. Like we like to always acknowledge everybody in our town, and it's sometimes we forget that there's groups, and and we need to take advantage of that to. Have have the good times as well as the the, the not so good times here in the in. Council chamber, so. Thank we should you for probably that. get you as a presentation for Rick. So what now? We should probably get boxing as a delegation at Rec Commission because we <coughs> sort of we have many user groups come. We try yeah. to have a music group at every single meeting. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, the boxing, the sport of boxing in Nelson has actually grown a lot in the last five years to the point where. I believe it's sort of amongst the, the top echelon as far as competing at a national slash international level. Yeah. Um, so that level of athlete, um, there's not too many too many sports in Nelson that compete at that level, but no. So yeah, it's it's good to see the the sporting culture progressing in that way. Excellent. Councillor Tate, you have a report for us this week. Sure, I was just going to jump off that conversation, though. I would, I would love to know if it would ever be possible to have a city space so that the many different sporting groups could share their successes, whether it's their trophies or medals or plaques or whatever it is. Um, I'm not sure how we would go about doing that. And, of course, there's an ever-growing number of different sporting groups, but, man, we do have a lot of great stuff going on here. I think just 
just in terms of that discussion is I would think that that would be something perhaps that um, you would maybe want to have a conversation um, with um, Astrid at the museum because we now now with the transition of the sports museum mm -hmm. that was uh, under the the great care and and consideration in terms of trying to represent all sports of, of Bill and Act and Ann McDonnell who are great as we know community volunteers um, and that they they did that for a long time and we've now successfully um, transitioned all of their sports holding over to um, Touchstone, uh, to the Nelson Museum. Boy, it's hard to lose those things that you've called something for a long, <laughs> a long time. I was on a committee when we were trying to find the original name. So, <laughs> um, but I think that would be a, a good place to have that uh, that discussion, and, and and perhaps there could be a display case where that is more is is is. Turned, I can't think of another word besides turned over, but you know, like moved along more um, in terms of sort of keeping it the, the current, but having a display case that could could feature those things. And so that's I would take that discussion there because we do have that, we do have those cabinets, and there is always opportunity, perhaps, to put more cabinets into um, the Nelson and um, into the rink and the sports complex yeah. itself. So. That discussion you can bring to the, you can bring to the table at the next, at a recreation mm. meeting. That makes, that makes but I mean, it makes perfectly good sense. And I mean, whether or not as as we do renovations in in the city hall here, which we all know are sort of on the books for some year at some point, that those kind of display cabinets where we can feature both right. sports and culture would be which would be great. Thank you. Uh, I also attended the AKBLG. And um, for folks who are interested in how government works and runs, one very fascinating part of the meeting is when um, all of the resolutions are brought forward for debate. And there was 18 this year. And ooh, I don't have it off the top of my head. 12 passed? I forget. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's the place where, as a city, we say to our local association, hey, this is what we would like to advocate for to higher levels of government. And it's a really important role that we do here. And City of Nelson brought forward six. And I think five of them passed. And that means that the AKBLG will bring those resolutions forward at the UBCM, Union of British Columbia Municipalities, and request that those be brought further forward to provincial counterparts. So super proud of us. Uh, we were busy beavers compared to some of the other municipalities. <laughs> A respectful debate. It was democracy in action. Quite, quite a sight to see. I uh, enjoyed participating in that. And ideas for new resolutions, right? And I, I look forward to our ideas for new resolutions. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Page, you probably have. A, you can probably see even more about the AKBLG. I could, but I won't start there. <laughs> um, <laughs> as so. Since our last update, we have had the Regional District Strategic Planning Session and had lots of discussions. Um, full reporting will come out when the drafts and the documents are completed and finished, which will be before we enter into the fullness of summer. So stay tuned for that, just letting you know that happened. I've been fairly busy in the last week, starting with uh, minister engagements down in Victoria uh, on behalf of the UBCM, uh, looking for continued investments in housing, uh, consultation for emergency preparedness, given the changes in legislation and its impact that will be happening when that uh, legislation is adopted uh, on our local communities, uh, and looking for economic development planning dollars as well as transitionary programming for various industries and workforces that are impacted by the changes in the, in the labor market demands and resources, and ensuring that we're helping uh, workers transition their skills effectively with programs that are impactful to their to those communities and specifically looking to ensure that the province is carving out space for local governments to be consulted about the needs of their local uh, workforces when various industries like sawmills and forestry and uh, even when you get into fossil fuel extraction and mining uh, need to be transitioned off because of various changes in the in the, the realities of the world. Um, we made a quick jump from, from that trip off into Cranbrook where we were hosting the Association of Community Boundary Local Government and 
it's meaningful to me uh, having worked with our team the last number of months uh, to put forward this presentation or put forward this conference. The theme of Stronger Together uh, resonated with everyone here in this room and, and many of the uh, participants and uh, mayors and counselors uh, around you know how we elevate our conversations how we move past divisiveness how we uh, see ourselves as as parts of a greater whole in the Kootenai boundary and and use that strength that we have uh, that does get recognized down in Vancouver down on the lower mainland I, I recall with quite a lot of distinction uh, a contingent from Nelson going down to the BC Tech Summit and creating quite a splash along with the rest of the Kootenays uh, in terms of what was going on, really brought attention to our area and what we were doing and how we collaborate together. It's just, you know, a big part of the planning that went into that conference was trying to uh, invite newly elected and, and uh, experienced elected officials to keep pushing that work forward and, and work as a group, work as a region, and s s uh, skill them with presenters and speakers that that helped everyone think in new and exciting ways and kind of put some language around some of that terminology so that we can you know bring that back to our council tables and you know just elevate the decision making environment as much as possible uh that's all completed and done and we're on to uh taking those resolutions off to ubcm where they will all be voted on again and and we will have the the, the broader provincial scope of what's a priority and most importantly, I think, uh, going forward is the association would really encourage and we'll be putting out communications along those lines of like, we don't have to wait until January or February to send in resolutions. You have ideas for resolutions now, engage with our resolutions team now. We will help you develop them. We will help you um, guide you in what kind of supporting documents might be helpful to help people make decisions. We want to see a lot more background material on resolutions, a lot more content to go with them, a lot more data, data, data to support the conclusions in them. Uh, and I, I look forward to that over the, the next two years of my presidential term, um, supporting that work and making sure that we're continuing to improve our dialogue in the region and give us you know, the best, strongest tools we can have to keep pushing the envelope in terms of what we need. And that is, yeah, those are my highlights. Thank you, Councilor Page. Thank you, Mayor. Mic drop. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to find some information for my, uh, and yes, why wait to the last minute to get in your resolutions? Oh, I forgot something. Uh-oh. Oh, so go, keep going then. I skipped past. Um, I didn't mean to, but I saw the word emergency <laughs> too many times in some of the lines. At the RDCK board meeting, of course, which also was last week, uh, the, the highlights for the most part are twofold in that we passed our emergency support services MOUs with immunities, which includes making sure those relationships are strong and our emergency man management we're working as a region. Uh, but we also had the climate change implementation plan, which uh, we had a quite a, a strong public showing. Uh, having concerns and feeling that they needed more time to sit with the documentation and understand and give feedback into what the implementation of our environmental stewardship would look like in the RDCK. So the RDCK has agreed to send that implementation plan back uh, to, through public consultation in, in the areas uh, and come back and bring it back in August as opposed to now. The plan itself I would highlight is very much uh, driven towards public consulting itself. Those were many of the steps was to take some of the initiatives and more about the individual steps. Uh, but there is at this time, um, I think a need, and I, I, my, the area directors really highlighted this, that the community wants, the community as often sometimes can happen, uh, will be introduced to a document and, and it may not be the first time the document was around, but it's the first time they've seen it, and so they really uh, do see the need for the, now that the community is very aware of it to have time with it, and provide that feedback, and give space for the understanding that can happen from it. But uh, those are the highlights from the board meeting. Now I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I just capture my thoughts here. 
I was just buying the maritime. Oh, thank you. Good job. I, I, I heard that it was a, a very um, fulsome um, RDCK meeting on Thursday with some concerns about their climate action. <clears throat> yeah, don't. Don't presume the RDCK board meetings are not exciting and fun. Watch it's just so unfortunate they're not. It's just it's so so unfortunate that they're not um, online exactly that we can't see them afterwards. That, that might have been discussed. Okay, so <laughs> gosh, Street. guess what I'm going to say? I attended the AKBLG <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Cranbrook, and I think if I look at my notes here, everybody stole what I was going to say. So congratulations to Councillor Page for continuing on with the next term as the um, president. Probably more importantly is uh, thank you for, I guess, having been re-elected so that there was somebody there that could step up to be the president um, this round. I think they would have had a tough <laughs> go of it um, had you not been there to lead this round. The, the, next, the next year will be so much simpler now that we're back into a... Mm. It's, it's always that thing at, at both AKBLG, UBCM, and we see it at FCM, at least up for our for British Columbia in terms of FCM, where there's an election year and all the people that thought they were going to get reelected and would be continuing on in their positions suddenly aren't there. And so these organizations, these affiliations, suddenly are at like, oh my, now who's going to be here? But um, Councillor Page did not um, shirk his responsibilities and stepped right up to become the... Um, the president to make sure that the organization went on. And I thought it was um, one of the best um, AKBLGs that I've been to in some time. I do hope you all took the opportunity to um, respond to uh, the feedback afterwards because I think there's always opportunity for in improvement. And while it's fresh in one's mind, the person needs to get on to that and, and do it. And, and also we have the direct line that I sent my... Um, comments directly to Councillor Page. <laughs> um, we also had, uh, so and then we talked about the resolutions, which was great. Um, Councillor uh, Tate and Councillor Woodward were um, up. I, I missed that part um, due to my flight schedule, uh, getting into the meeting and so, but I heard that they did a fantastic job. All, everybody was saying, where'd you get those councillors? Um, so happy to uh, um, know that you guys were very active and that we got our resolutions um, uh, passed. And obviously, we are a busy bunch of beavers here because if there was only 18 resolutions put in uh, from all across the East and West Kootenays, we submitted six of them, so a third. So That's good work. <laughs> and uh, and um, Councillor Woodward um, talked about uh, sort of like the theme and the and the relationship between the presentations that we're on, talking about code of conduct, um, respect, trust, and um, civility. There was some very good um, presentations and a couple of books that were mentioned that have definitely sparked my interest to look at um, picking up. Perhaps as we go to these things and we see a good book, perhaps think about buying it or coming back and the city can purchase a good book and we could start a little library in our um, where we have our mail section for those of us counselors and we could perhaps um, read some of these books and then share them and and circulate them I'm I'm still kind of a turn the page person so I'm not so good on the electronic book but um, other things um, just a reminder of oh and last week I was I, I have done a few things but last week I was away and I attended my um, very last uh, in my official capacity as being a, a board member of my union that I belong to for my working career. And it's never lost on me the similarities between uh, when you go to a, uh, a union convention that's talking about um, governance or you go to the AKBLG and you talk about governance or you come to the city council table and you talk about governance and you know hot topics that were on the floor and in the convention hall, housing, homelessness, toxic drug supply, we talk about staffing and whether or not we can get wait staff for restaurants here. We were talking about they're they're not making any more um, MRI technicians, and there's a, a shortage of physiotherapists and pharmacists are in short supply. So workforce issues are um, abundant. 
uh, small rural communities uh, in terms of health care obviously are facing the same things we all face the same things you get a job somewhere uh, you, you want to come to Nelson because there's a job here and a good paying job in health care but there's still no house or the house is so expensive it doesn't matter how good your good paying job is it's it's not enough so it's, it's always interesting to me to have that cross-sectional um, uh, look at the world and then realize um, that we're not all that all that difference, although there would be a lot that would put a divide between, say, the unions and the and the private sector. But um, um, just a reminder: we just this uh, earlier today we did the uh, CBT uh, ready grant process, and um, I know that they'd like me to pass along that the CBT strategic planning proce public process um, is ongoing right now, where they're developing their next um, plan to carry them forward for the next uh, few years. And so again, the public is invited to participate in that. Um, the CBT is a valuable resource. Um, we just gave out here, just in the community of Nelson, $147,000 earlier um, today. That's uh, from the from the trust. That public meeting is on um, May the fourth. It'll be at the Prestige, and it will be held from three to eight thirty. It's, you don't have to go at three and think you're going to be there till 8:30. It is an open, it is an open um, process, and then they will be having a symposium in Trail in June, and you must register for that. And again, that's open to the public. That's just not open to politicians. And um, it's always a very good. They they do unbelievable uh, presentations on all the sectors in the in the basin, and this year's entertainer is Rick Mercer. <laughs> So um, the closest that the, there's three symposium, the closest one will be in trail. And um, I also went to the uh, Honor House. I'm, I'm familiar with that organization. They do uh, great work and they basically just run on volunteer funds. So the Honor House Honor Ranch presentation was great. And it was super to see um, Councillor Payne being able to come and attend. Um, I also last week or perhaps it was the week before, um, attended the Canadian Association of um, Police Governance. This is a pan-Canadian um, group um, representing all kinds of different forces across uh, Canada, including um, yeah, Indigenous tribal uh, police uh, forces. And um, lots of good discussion there all the time in terms of talking about bail reform, talking about uh, prisons. It's a, it's a full gamut of, of policing and policing um, related issues. And we meet every two, two months for, uh, for a pan-Canadian um, teleconference. And I may, I may attend this year. It's, it's far away. It's their annual convention this year is in St. John's, um, Newfoundland. So one has to give some consideration to the um, the costs of, of going across the country for their um, meeting, but they're a very interesting organization. So far, two meetings. I'm looking forward to the next meeting. And my last um, little bit here is I'd like to announce, seeing so I'm going to steal the city manager's thunder because this would have probably been on his list of announcements. Is as you all know, we've had a job posting out for uh, general manager of community planning, climate, and infrastructure, and that uh, process of uh, vetting applicants um, has been completed. And I'm happy to announce that uh, Chris Johnson has been awarded the job, and he will be starting with us in May the, May the first. Many of you will be, or some of you will be familiar with him, as he has been. Um, the lead at in terms of emergency planning uh, for the regional district of Central Kootenai. He's a local guy, so it's uh, great to know that there's somebody that's coming in that that has the understanding of the local um, community. And when you get to see him, um, please take the opportunity to to welcome him aboard. His office will be here on the administrative uh, floor. So, and that's all I think I have to say. So here we are at the record-breaking, always wondered when this was going to happen, and it has. Nice. It's 5.07. Amazing. Any other issues that people would like to discuss? Otherwise, I will ask for adjournment, and we will reconvene at 7, so we could have time to walk, and of course, dinner. We have dinner to contemplate. Councillor Payne. I'm just going to do another uh, public service announcement for a strategic... Correct.
um, for another week. If you haven't had the opportunity to um, engage in that, go for it. If you have had the opportunity to engage in it, do it again. Because now you can go back in and see what everybody else had to say and see, hey, I didn't think of that one before. I'd like to um, boost that up. Or it might uh, spark uh, some other creative concept. I think it's really important if you haven't um, yet shared it with groups whose voice might not traditionally um, engage with that sort of process, that there are opportunities to do that. And it's about another week, I think, till next Monday is what I heard. Uh, no, two weeks. Two weeks to get in um, on that. It's a pretty important opportunity to share your thoughts with council before we go into strategic planning in mid-May and make sure that we're looking out at the entire community and gathering the thoughts of all the, the residents and groups that are here. Great. And I did forget um, one thing. I just, I just wanted to mention um, uh, I mean, that there's many great community-minded people that, that, that uh, pass away in our in our city, but I, I, I do I do want to to mention the the passing of um, Al Dawson, who's who was a local politician here for many many years. Not a not a city councillor, but he was a regional district uh, director for Area F, and he was first elected in um, 1972 and did a, a few terms, and then um, I had the the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Dawson was a fine adversary and. Uh, Community champion, I can tell you that uh, I, I I enjoyed the, uh, the back and forth and the repartee. He served uh, five terms in a row before he uh, resigned in uh, or retired in 2008. So from 1993 to um, 2008. So I enjoyed his company during my term from 1999 to 2002. And uh, a great a great community minded guy. We didn't always see eye to eye, but boy, if if you could get Al Dawson on your team. You were you were going to get a home run every time, and I think it's uh, important to talk about him in terms of uh, baseball because that was one of his uh, big things uh, growing up. He was, and he grew up here in Nelson. He was a big, uh, I believe he pitched. He was very involved uh, with baseball, really a big sports advocate. But overall, like you see him at FCM or UBCM, and he's always promoting. Uh, the Kootenays and, and this region and so I would just like to acknowledge it and on behalf of uh, City Council pass along our condolences to his wife Margaret and his um, three children so thank you for that. Okay, seeing no other announcements at this time or any other further discussion, I would like to ask for a recess, moved by Page, seconded by Woodward, all those in favour? Okay, great and we'll Okay, we're going to start a whole minute, 30 seconds early. Yay. Anyways, if I could have a motion to reconvene the meeting, please. Moved by Tate, seconded by Paige. All those in favor, all those opposed, and that carries. Welcome, everybody. It's so wonderful to see the council chambers um, full this evening. And uh, please, uh, please note that the next meeting is May the 9th, and we'd like to have a full chamber then as well. Um, we're going to start this evening with our cultural presentation, and I'd like to um, turn it over to Joy uh, Barrett for the introduction. Joy Barrett, for those who don't know, are, is our cultural development officer for the city of Nelson. Hi, everybody. April 2023 is the 25th annual National Poetry Month, founded by the League of Canadian Poets. Established in 1966, the League is a national art service organization dedicated to supporting poets, building poetic communities, supporting inclusive and equitable free expression, and promoting Canadian poets and poetry. 
Tonight, I'm pleased to invite local poet Zainab Mohammed, who will read her poem, Beneath the Surface. Zainab is an award-winning professional performance poet. She was born on the coast of BC to immigrant parents fleeing war-torn countries. Inspired by the hardships her family has endured, her writing touches on what is possible in the realms of healing and creating new ways forward. She is a visionary creative who has been healing herself through the written word by sharing her story and by giving her audience reflections into self-love and self-empowerment. She is currently producing her first ever one woman show entitled, Are You Listening? Um, she started Poem Booth in 2014 while hitchhiking across Canada and she hosts the Nelson Poetry Slam and performs at various events in her region provincially and nationally. Zainab lives and works in the Slocan Valley with her dog, Threshold. Welcome, Zainab. I don't know who to face. Face the, face the, face audience. the, face the audience. Okay. I'm not As here. we'll all hear through the mic, so. Okay. Well, sorry for giving me Or face the camera. Um, it's okay. I don't need to face the camera. <laughs> we need an audience. All right. This is my fancy. We can hear you perfectly. All right. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Okay. This is one of my favorite poems called Beneath the Surface. It is lengthy and has lots of words. And the intention is for you uh, not to necessarily grasp the whole thing, but let it take you where it takes you. It's okay. Do you guys like my microphone? <laughs> <laughs> this is a first. Hey, John. <laughs> Just in time. Thank you, Joy, for the introduction. Okay. Take a moment to look in the mirror. Close your eyes. What do you see? Peace of mind. Where to find peace of mind? Just an echo. And thoughts are soon to be privatized if you don't fit the standard. You're cast as a foe, like a cheap leather jacket you buy, so eager to fit in to some circle, some moment where the light shines on you. But what about our roots? From the darkest places grow the brightest trees, and so we sow seeds in dirt. The darker, the better, fueled with compost and manure. It's no joke. Wisdom is not what we inherit. It cannot be memorized. We must walk over bridges or build them. In the differences, we find how connected everything really is. Our independence, our dependence, our interdependence rises like a flame, like a mighty golden sunrise. And this scares some who wish to control or subdue you for your steps shake and crumble the mirrors of distraction. Remember, your eye is on you. And what will it take to find more parallels, to find where ignorance lives within and participate in trading it in for some heavy duty truth? or insight. Would you like to see who is the one breathing your every breath? If thoughts were not censored, if we had access to the profits made that keep so many confined, controlled by hands you and me didn't choose, for the grassroots of this system are dead like the hair on our head, yet it still grows. What if we participate 
in turning the hand of time to activate our suffering into opportunity, to take the trouble, the pain, the injustice, and the shame, and look at it right in the face, hold our stare, and look even deeper. This is revolution, to no longer be consumed by everyday living, merely to survive and pass on to the next generations all that we were never given. To wake up and see, so wake up and see what lives beneath the surface. Eyes closed, there must be an echo in this chamber. There must be a way through, a way to be kind to oneself and to others, to believe in what isn't and what has never been. There must be constellations full of stories, like songs, maps of perceptions, wormholes to our freedom. But is it so simple? History tells us not. It says we have never lived as sister and brother. It says we are fools of greed, of power, and of wealth. But history is written by men. Her story is not passed down to children growing up. In libraries, you may find feminism books, but let me tell you, this hierarchy is a design because each and every human on this planet got to be here because a woman gave birth, so while women we're busy raising families, men wrote the books. And we believed them, I mean, these were our parents. And some of us went astray, finding our own way apart from dogma and constraint, unlearning the narrow mindset, finding truth wherever we look. Because broken pieces can be sewn back together and fractures can be healed. It doesn't matter how many times you break or you're wrong or how many times you make mistakes. When the sun rises, we have a new day, a fresh start, if we so choose. Trends have been made to keep folks consumed, so learn from the past and find new ways. Make waves with your footsteps. Make waves wherever you go. Let there be water in every moment to be thanked for giving you and giving me this life and our health. The drops that quench our fear and adversity, stepping into resiliency, the wings we all carry like webs of spiders, all interconnected. So look up, see what is around, above and beyond. There is a world where we can all exist, where we can think different thoughts with no hate in our hearts, where we look out for each other and tend to our soil. A world where the pyramid of control gets flipped upside down. A world where we are the leaders of our humanity as a people and a person, as an individual and a unit counted at the table. A world where we listen more than we speak so that we can see further than our eyes can see and deeper than our thoughts get weaved. And if we can get there, the way must be all ways. Impossible, I've been told, maybe. Isn't it worth pulling up ideas of freedom, of justice, of peace? We can't find what we're not looking for. Comfort breeds complacency, and somehow this is a trend. We pretend we are powerless. Have you looked inside yet? We have ourselves a mess and we're still waiting for someone else to fix this. We are born dreamers, so why is it that we gave up, gave in to a system that steals dreams from under our beds? I am tired and fed up of my own static movement. An activist is being born not to break down doors, but to open hearts so that this home is no longer divided by thoughts I keep playing in my head. So drop into your heart. Drop into your heart. Feel it with your mind. What do you see? 
when you close your eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab, for your very um, moving words. I'm, I'm actually, I, I never listen to city council meetings on, on replay, but I will be looking <laughs> to re-listen again to your words. Um, that was wonderful. Would you like to... Would you like to tell us anything about what you're doing? Like, we always allow um, people to have a few words. If you want to tell us a little bit about your show that you're producing, do you have a date? Do you have um, any other things that you'd like to share with us? Sure, I can share some things. Yeah, my show will be coming out in the fall, um, and it's going to be in Nelson at the Bunker at the museum. We're going to do a couple of shows there, I think, in October. And yeah, right now I'm currently uh, artist in residence at the museum creating a mural for the new Echoes in the Staircase. So stay tuned. That's going to be really special. And it's going to be really special. What else am I doing? I'm doing a lot of things. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm doing a lot of things. I write poems. <laughs> Aren't we all doing a lot of things? I write poems on a typewriter, and I'll be at the market in the summertime. So stop by and say, hey, get a poem if you want. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Inspiring words for all of us. Excellent. So the next item... Uh, on the agenda tonight is uh, public participation and I'm aware that there's at least one person can I have a show of hands of others okay we have two people for public participation oh three people for public participation that's uh, that's great I'm gonna go uh, pink white and black sorry I'm just, I, I'm just having a moment here with like, I, I, I know all of you, I, I'm just, a, I've never ever had a good capacity for names, so my apologies. Um, please come forward, I'm going to read you just the statement before you start. And uh, yeah, so public participation period is limited to 15 minutes in total. A speaker may only address council once for a maximum of three minutes, unless other authorized otherwise by unanimous vote of council members present. Speakers must restrict, restrict their remarks to items that are listed on the meeting agenda. Speakers must not address council regarding a matter for which a public hearing must be held or has been held prior to con council's consideration of the matter or adoption of the bylaw. Speakers must not address council regarding a permit for which public notice must be given or has been given prior to council's consideration of issuance of the permit. Speakers shall address all comments through the mayor or presiding member. We do ask you for your name and place of residence. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm Judy O'Leary. I live in Nelson, and I'm here from the West Coast Climate Hub. And you will have just recently received a letter from ourselves, the West Kootenai Cycling Coalition, the Doctors and Nurses for Planetary Health, and the LVR Green Team, reiterating our support for an anti-idling bylaw. So I want to take this opportunity to just make a couple of points about this request. First, one thing we want to stress is that our members come from 23 different partner organizations and they are not all focused on climate. They're quite broadly based and they're mostly in Nelson. So they represent a very broad range of community interests, not just climate focus or climate activism. Our members include faith groups, parents, healthcare workers, youth, etc. We have a direct mailing list of over 850 right now, and our partners reach hundreds more. So my point is that our members are a cross-section of the residents that you serve. Secondly, we don't feel this is a big ask. Uh, if you implement an anti-idling bylaw, yes, you will get some complaints initially for sure, and then people will move on to the usual things, harassing you about snow clearance, etc. I guarantee <laughs> it. It won't go on forever. And also, you know, we will help you a lot with this. We're ready to implement. We've even printed some materials to implement an education campaign, which we will go ahead with regardless of whether or not there is a bylaw, but we feel it will be much more effective with one. So we will do that work. All that we're asking you for is a bylaw and a few signs, nothing else. Third, please don't worry that this is too ambitious. 
I have a friend in the District of North Vancouver Council, and she always used to say to her council, don't worry, we're not leading. Like, it's okay. So many other councils have passed such a bylaw, many of them years and years ago. Um, for example, in BC, Caslow, Terrace, Nanaimo, Kelowna, to name a few, have these bylaws. Finally, Council has already received evidence of an incredible amount of community support for an anti-idling bylaw. It was strongly supported in the Nelson Next consultations a few years ago. Last summer, you received many letters in support of this. I remember meeting with the mayor who said it was too many letters. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so you're not going to see a lot of mention of this in the thought exchange for two reasons. When that came out, we really didn't feel we either had to or could ask people once again to tell you when they had already told you so many times. And also that thought exchange, once it becomes filled up, it takes a long, long time to scroll through it to vote, upvote things. So we have asked recently for members and friends and associates and community members to let you know again. But please know that you've already received a lot of support for this. So when there's this much community support for a low-cost way to reduce emissions and air pollution, especially for children, because there's lots of idling at schools, my question to you is, why wouldn't you just move ahead with this easy move that you could do? Thank you so much. Thanks, Judy. My name is Dave Gregory. I live in town at 922 Fifth Street. And I just want to briefly say three things. First, I'd like to applaud the council for asking BC Transit to double the public transportation budget for the West Kootenays. A much better bus service will help the government meet the clean BC target of 25% reduction in vehicle use. So I was very glad to see that. Secondly, I appreciate the major changes to public transportation and our BC and our Nelson bus service do require better funding. Yet there are some small but very useful improvements to Nelson's transit system that could be surely made within the existing budget. For example, the website is inferior. It really needs an update to make sure it provides all the information travelers need. Another example. There are bus shelters, for example, on Gordon Street, where I live nearby, lacking glass or simply sighted on the wrong side of the road. I'm thinking particularly of the one under the Orange Bridge which is very dangerous if you sit on the wrong side of the road because you can't see bus and traffic coming around the corner, and yet you have to run across the road in order to get the bus. If I had more time, I could give you more examples of things that I personally and the um, action group for better public transportation that we have in Nelson now thinks are good improvements, some of which we know need more money, but others we think could be done relatively uh, cheaply. But the point I want to make now is that there appears to be no easy way of getting anyone to listen and respond effectively to feedback from the public. We just don't know how to talk to the relevant people who can make small changes and get those changes to happen. How, for example, do I get somebody to improve the website? So I think we'd appreciate some better channel of communication. So that's my second point. The last thing I want to say is I would urge the council to go ahead promptly with passing a no idling bylaw. You've heard lots of detailed reasons from Judy, but basically we've waited a long time for a measure which has not only symbolic importance, but it will also be very good for the pulmonary health of our citizens, especially children near schools. 
I don't think this is a minor issue. I think clean air is really important, and I would urge you to act as quickly as possible. So thank you very much for allowing me to bring these things to your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Gregory. Councillor Page? Yeah, I just did have a question for David. So thank you, David. Um, yeah. On the conversation of communication, has your group been in discussions and tried out the transit app? Because all the, all the buses were outfitted last summer with transponders. I'm sure some people use it. I personally don't have a cell phone, so it's no use to me. Okay. Um, but what I do say is that if you go to the, um, the website and you look at things, for instance, you want to see what a, where, a, where you can get a bus from there to there, you actually need the numbers of the signs and you can't get the numbers of the, of the bus stops right. on the website, for example. If you call on the number, what you find is that it's only serviced until 3.30 on weekdays, and there you are on a Saturday or an evening or something wanting to know how you can get home, mm -hmm. and it's no help at all. And I do think that um, the public transit is important enough that we should you know, have good information available to people who don't happen to have cell phones. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have five minutes here. Is that cool? Uh, everybody else has been three. For a matter of fact, um, Mr. Gregory was actually two, like forty-nine. Like he was like L perfect. So I know that you can speak quickly. What, so do you want me to just speak as fast as possible then? Well, we'll we'll see how you do. Yeah, I do. Okay, thank you. I'm Brian McLaughlin. I'm the uh, <clears throat> I'm a retired nurse and I'm an artist in the community. I'm a co-chair of Kootenai Freedom. We have 1,300 members. I've been on the board of the Eco Society in the past for 13 years. <clears throat> if anyone is an environmentalist, it's me. I appreciate the work the city is doing on the environment. Thank you very much. Each and every one of you. Uh, what I'm going to offer you today is a view of the bigger picture to be aware of. The 15-minute city idea is not a grassroots idea. It is a top-down global plan under the Agenda 2030 to roll out 17 sustainable goals where there are long-term implications of net zero. And there are long-term uh, implications. This agenda means no flying, no shipping, no cars. All wood burning and gas appliances will be gone by 2025. This is not about pollution. It's about creating energy dependence and central control. We are told it's a climate emergency. As the elites, not wearing masks, not vaccinated, park their 400 jets at the climate change summit meeting, why is this? Top-down control appears to be appears to be a green. It is not. It is implemented at Ur it was implemented at the Earth Summit in 1992 by a bunch of oil billionaires who are crooks. What is coming coming to know? Uh, known as Zero Trust World, whether you know it or not, digital ID is coming. And this means that the government will have all your data in one place. And they wa they're wanting to bring this in by December of this year. This is very serious. And it is br bringing in by the central, central bank digital currencies. It doesn't matter if you believe in climate change or not. This, this, is, a, this is not about being green. This is big business and central control. They need an electric grid to get total financial control. They need everyone on electrical system where you will be doing all your transitions digitally and then control where you can travel and turn off your money at will. This is being done without our consent. In zero trust world where data is, is the new oil, you will not be able to open your computer, access your bank account or go to the hospital without your digital ID. This, and this will be unlocked by your facial recognition. Our, your shopping habits, health records, is being sold to, to stakeholders on the blockchain, 
central bank digital currencies, and implemented by the United Nations. You think the United Nations are our friends? You're wrong. The UN and the World Economic Forum are working together with our government and bringing down technology for surveillance from the air. A government document says that there will be 900,000 drones by 2030. Who is in charge of this Green New Deal? Michael Bloomberg, Mayor of New York, billionaire. Mark Carney, former head of Bank of England and the Bank of Canada. He came to res rescue HSBC when they were caught money laundering for Mexican drug cartels. Not a good guy. Unlikely he is driven by the concern for the environment. Mark Carney said in 2019 speech, a new economic system will be needed to move the UN into a world based on climate change. If you want to be outraged about climate change, why not focus on this fact? Brian, our, I'm just going to give you 30 more seconds. Awesome. Our military is one of the most polluting organizations on earth, and they are not included in the Green New Deal, but they need the military to enforce the system of control. Just like COVID, you don't have time to think about what they're telling you. You just have to accept these solutions, because if you don't, something really, really bad will happen. As Bonnie is telling us now to line up for our third booster or be fired, this is, this is uh, not, not truth when we have 26 million injured from the vaccine. Brian, your time. I've given you more than three minutes. I've given you almost four minutes. My last one is just positive about you guys. Just <laughs> let, let's, be, let's be this chain, stand up to tyranny, create a vibrant local system of commerce and food production. Local, local, local. Thank you, How's Brian. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah. And thank you again for all the participants, Judy, Dave, and Brian. So appreciate. I mean, it doesn't seem like a lot of time, but um, you know, we're here to listen to um, a, a diversity of views and everyone that wants to come forward. So I do encourage people to use this public participation time um, to come forward and, and speak at council meetings. So thank you again to the three of you tonight for um, sharing your views with us. I appreciate it, as does Council. Okay, and I want to make sure I didn't, was there anybody I missed? Because th with three minutes we have like, okay, I'm good, everybody's good back there. So, moving on to uh, item number 12, we have delegations tonight, we have three delegations before us this evening, and so um, if the URSA project Society, the Bear Smart Group would like to come forward. And while they're getting set there, if you need to bring up another chair, feel free to bring another, pull a chair from somewhere. And just a reminder that um, presentations are about uh, 10 minutes to allow us to have some uh, discussion if there's a need for any questions at the end of the presentation time. So, there you go. And if you can make sure that you introduce yourself and Tell us who your team is. And are, are there not three of you? Is somebody? Just, two of just oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'm Anita Johnson. This is Captain Gray from the Project. Do we control this, the just PowerPoint? Hit the, arrow button. hit the arrow button. Okay. And are both their mics on? Sorry, she's just not working. We just want to make sure that both your mics oh, are on. Hello. Yeah. Okay. okay thanks, Keith. Testing. Yep. Lights off. We just want to make sure that people that listen at home, which there seems to be a lot of, can make sure that they get to hear. Okay. Speak a lot of. It's not moving. No. The arrow key? No. Oh, the arrow. Not touch. There, there we go. go. Okay. The URSA Project is a registered nonprofit society that is gravely concerned about the high number of black bears being destroyed in Nelson. We are devoted to seeking change to the current waste management and wildlife attractant policies that contribute to human wildlife conflict within our city. The purposes of the society are to promote coexistence between humans and bears and support and encourage the municipal adoption of the Bear Smart Community Program. 
Our, our vision is a community where humans and bears can peacefully coexist. And our mission is to minimize the number of bears destroyed in Nelson through advocacy, education, and outreach. How will we promote coexistence? Through increased community outreach and education, attending farmers markets, and visiting schools, homes, and businesses to talk with people about securing attractants to keep people and bears safe. By encourage, continuing to encourage the city to adopt bear smart policies and practices and increase bylaw enforcement. By continuing to monitor bear sightings and human bear conflict in Nelson. And by sharing information with the public on how many bears have been killed in Nelson and BC Conservation Officer service policies <coughs> in regard to non-relocation of food condition black bears and orphan cubs. Now here's a graph where you can see the years from 2015 to 2021. And this graph just shows the top 10 um, out of 161 municipalities. Nelson ranked ninth highest in bear deaths of the whole province out of 161 communities. Nelson is a smorgasbord for bears. These photographs taken in Nelson pretty much illustrate that. Communities that do not adequately manage their garbage are very attractive to bears due to the highly concentrated sources of calorie rich foods. Bears will remain in places such as these because they don't need to expend much energy to search for food. This increases their chance of attaining the thick layer of fat that they require to survive hibernation and increases their reproductive success. Bears that have access to plentiful food sources have more cubs, have them more frequently, and then they teach those cubs how to access the human food. By not managing our garbage and other attractants, we are only compounding the human bear conflict situation. In 2022, the BC Conservation Officer Service received 478 human bear conflict calls for Nelson, resulting in 17 black bears being destroyed. 15 out of the 17, or 88% of these bears, were food condition bears that had accessed human generated garbage and or fruit and nut trees. In contrast, the neighboring bear smart community of Castlegar saw nine bears destroyed with 194 human bear conflict calls, which is 52% and 60% less than Nelson respectively. Once again, uh, recent photos from Nelson. The number of black bears destroyed each year varies, but on the whole, the numbers are steadily rising. From 2006 to 2012, a total of 20 black bears were destroyed in Nelson. From 2015 to 2021, this number more than tripled, and a total of 64 black bears were destroyed in Nelson. In 2022, there were almost as many bears killed as there were in the entire seven-year period from 2006 to 2012. Uh, this, this graph covers a seven year period and shows Nelson's bear deaths in red versus population in blue compared to other larger cities in BC. The amount of bears killed in Nelson is very disproportionate when compared to our population. It is reasonable to assume that larger populations produce more waste and have more wildlife attractants, yet Nelson's bear deaths are much higher than cities with greater populations. The URSA project consulted with bear biologists from the area to try to understand why there were so many bears coming into the city. And we learned that some of the reasons are natural food source decline, attributed to changing weather patterns and climate change, 
um, poor garbage man management. A bear is habituated to humans and conditioned to human foods will alter their natural movements between habitat types to utilize areas with lax garbage. <coughs> this affects bear density in the area and places bears and humans in close, closer proximity than would be otherwise the case. Also development into bear habitat and displacement of bear populations. While some of these factors can, that can bring bears into the community might be beyond our reasonable control, or garbage management is not one of them. We can improve the management of attractants and we can control what happens when the bears do arrive by ensuring that there are no accessible wildlife attractants that encourage bears to stick around and become food conditioned. This is a common misconception that trapped black bears are usually relocated. Black bears that are trapped and deemed food conditioned by, the conser by conservation are not candidates for relocation. They are taken away and destroyed. Conservation will not give permission to or orphan cubs for orphan cubs to be sent to wildlife rehab facilities from communities with extreme level of bear attractants, such as Nelson. These cubs are either destroyed or left on their own in the wild, and most do not survive. Residents and businesses should be made aware that their behavior has the potential to directly affect whether a bear, whether it lives or dies. There's a woman named Lucy Cadman of the North Shore Black Bear Society, and she said it this way. It really needs to be more clear with the public about what is happening with these animals because that's the only way anything's going to change. If people are under the, pression, under the impression that bears are just taken away from the community and put back into the forest, there's no incentive, incentive for them to change their behaviors. In the past, human-bear conflict was widely perceived to be the result of problem bears. Because of this, prior management of human-bear conflict in BC was primarily reactive. This approach of managing the bears and not managing the root of the problem um, is not only archaic but ineffective. Removing the bear and not the attractant will only create an opportunity for another bear to move in and it becomes a vicious cycle of conflict and killing. Problem bears are not born, they are created through human carelessness and neglect. The only long-term solution is to prevent problem bears from being created in the first place. The Bear Smart Community Program details the steps and procedures by which communities can reduce human bear conflict and shift from reactive management of problem bears to proactive management of the attractants that draw bears into communities. So here we wanted to talk a little bit about the benefits of becoming a bear smart community. And the benefits are many. Uh, the primary goal of the bear smart community program is to diminish the rate and intensity of human bear conflicts. Our neighborhoods must be porous to wildlife activity. And that means ensuring that wildlife can move through our community without being attracted to non-natural food. This will, as you can see in the slide, improve public safety, reduce, proper, reduce property damage, and have fewer bears killed due to conflict. Bear Smart Communities has, have seen a 20% reduction in conflict calls. If Nelson were Bear Smart, in 2022, there might have been 96 fewer conflict calls that had a potential for bears being destroyed. A conservation officer would gain the option of considering non-lethal control measures such as hazing or relocation instead of killing them. Adversive conditioning of bears is only considered in communities that are designated bear smart. An added benefit of managing wildlife attractants for bears is that it also removes accessibility to rats, skunks, raccoons, crows, and any other animals roaming about at large. 
Um, streets and alleys would look cleaner and more attractive. A uh, culture of caring and respect for the wildlife where we live would help to portray a positive and responsible municipal image for the residents and the visitors to Nelson. The Bear Smart Community Program is based on a series of established criteria. So for the sake of brevity, I will touch on the main list of criteria. Further details can be found in the Bear Smart Community Program background report. One, prepare a bear hazard assessment. Two, prepare a bear human conflict management plan. Three, revise planning and decision making documents. Four, implement a continuing education program. Five, develop and maintain a bear proof waste management system. And six, implement and enforce bear smart bylaws. And the good news is Nelson already has two out of those six things accomplished with the bylaws and continuing education program with WildSafe. So I'm going to just say a few things about this slide before I get into the points on that there. Um, in the 2022 WildSafe BC annual report for Nelson and the conservation's conflict reports, improperly managed garbage and fruit nut trees continue to be the main sources of human wildlife conflict in Nelson. Public participation and compliance are key to the success of the community wildlife management. And this requires not only education and the right tools to succeed, but enforcement of bylaws for those residents who refuse to comply. In accordance with the Bear Smart Community Program guidelines and Wild Safe BC re rep recommendations, the Ursa Project Society requests that the city consider the following opportunities or initiatives. And here's the slide. To increase Enforcement of the wildlife attractant bylaw and implement a compliance strategy. To consider options for making secure, bear proof, or bear resistant residential waste storage available to all residents. Options include certified bear resistant garbage containers, bear proof residential dumpsters, or community compactors. Bear proofing the waste disposal within a community is one of the first steps in bear proofing the community to incorporate wildlife friendly language and bear smart practices into the official community plan and the solid waste, waste management plan, planning documents as well. Um, to uh, amend the city bylaw number 2375 to please allow electric fencing to be used within the city. It's a good tool. Um, to distribute wildlife attractant management and conflict prevention materials along with information about potential fines for noncompliance with bylaws to all Nelson Hydro customers in their bills, or at least their first bill. <clears throat> and a few more on the list. Um, six, amend the wildlife attractant bylaw to reflect that businesses operating within the city of Nelson would be required to contain their waste within dumpsters with metal lids and locking devices, and to store grease barrels within wildlife proof enclosures. There was a lot of bear activity last year downtown in Nelson, and it just seemed to be ongoing with restaurant garbage that was just overflowing and dumpsters not being closed or locked or Uh, number seven, provide pick me signs for residents to display near their fruit and nut trees to encourage the harvesting of unwanted fruit and nuts. Initiate a community dialogue that identifies the prevention of human wildlife conflict as a shared priority. And nine, continue replacing open top municipal garbage cans with bear resistant models and removing old cans. On September the 9th, 2022, a black bear sow and one of her two cubs of the year, who are pictured on the next slide, were shot and killed in Nelson by the BC Conservation Officer Service after accessing unsecured residential garbage 
and fruit and nut trees. It happened on a Friday afternoon, shortly after elementary school let out three blocks away. The second cub escaped up a tree. Residents in the area reported hearing a bear cub loudly bawling in distress for several nights after the cub's family was killed. We have not heard whether this little orphan cub survived the winter alone or not. This tragic incident was the catalyst for the formation of the Ursa Project. And there they are. Black bears are not the fearsome creatures of popular myth who rise up on their hind legs, teeth bared, and must be killed before they themselves kill. This is the cocaine bear, right? <laughs> 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 you are 45 times more likely to be killed by a dog. You are 120 times more likely to be killed by bees. <laughs> and 60,000 times more likely to be murdered by another human than to be killed by a black bear. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight on this important topic. The Ursa Project is pleased to support and encourage the city and our community in working together towards achieving progressive bear smart policies and practices. We cannot kill our way out of the problems that we humans have created. With bears already facing increasing pressure due to climate change, habitat loss and displacement, it is more important than ever to ensure that we practice humane, ethical stewardship of the wildlife that share their home with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Any questions, Council? Okay, seeing none. I just would uh, like to be able to announce to you that um, maybe you were watching earlier today when we started our earlier discussions, but um, the city did, uh, through the um, Columbia Basin Trust, the Ready Grants, we have um, awarded you uh, the full amount of what you asked for through the granting process. Um, Excellent. Thank you. you. It's going to take a little bit of time for that money because it, it's got to go through about another 20 meetings before you finally get a check. <laughs> But um, uh, we think the checks will come from the Columbia Basin Trust uh, directly uh, to you sometime in June. But you were approved for the um, full amount of, of your ask. So the City of Nelson looks forward to continuing to work with your, you and your group um, going forward. So congratulations on your thank, thank, you. thank you and much gratitude for your part of that process. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just have a little handout thing. I, I just have one copy of it, but it's just like some further information on Bear Smart stuff and our requested you, initiatives. Could yeah, so if you give that to Sarah, who will meet you okay. halfway down the, sure. down the aisle, okay. and um, she can make sure that every uh, counselor gets a copy in there, she'll turn it into a PDF and, and email it to those. I, I still like the paper. I'm kind of with uh, um, Dave there that I'd be having a hard time finding the the bus too because I don't I don't really like using the cell phone so <laughs> um, I like mine in paper but other ones will get it by electronically so thank you very much for that again um, Anita and Kathleen and thank you for all your work and um, earlier today I heard some great comments from other councils I, I know I follow you on Instagram and Facebook one of the few things that I do do on my phone and um, please keep up the great the, the great work there and so that everybody can share and then that increases the education in a freeway. So thank you so much. Um, next up we have, who's next? Fortis BC. I'd like to ask uh, Blair Weston. Blair, did you bring, did you bring um, Jennifer with you tonight? Uh, no, I did not. Jennifer's uh, doing some indigenous training down on the lower mainland. Oh, okay. So um, Blair Weston from Fortis BC has requested the opportunity to present to Nelson support provincial and municipal emission reduction goals and assist in the transition to a low carbon energy future. 
This will include an overview of renewable natural gas, liquid natural gas, and, and energy efficiency. So over to you, um, Blair. Thanks very much. Uh, so hi, my name is Blair Weston. I work for Ford SBC. It's a pleasure to be in front of council again today. Um, just uh, some housekeeping here. Um, I'm going to say CO2 sometimes when I mean CO2 equivalents. And uh, also, I started out at Fortis as an energy efficiency advisor um, with the company, and I was very poor at math, so they promoted me. And so from there, I see pieces of the puzzle rather than the numbers. So you'll see I'm going to round some numbers around, it, but the ratios will stay the same. So uh, those us know Ford SPC, you can see from this map, we have a shared service territory where gas and electric utility, we also have a, a propane a gas network in Arrival Stoke. Um, we have four generating plants on the Kootenai River. Um, we provide the city of Nelson with 50% of its energy. Um, we also have a pipe system in the ground. We're not a company that produces or produces any gas. We deliver gas, we deliver what gas and renewable natural gas right now to British Columbians. We're fuel agnostic. Whatever people want in their pipes, um, if we can get it to them, we'll, we'll get them to it. Um, we're BC's largest deliverer of energy. Uh, why we're here today is because there is a climate issue and um, we're acutely aware of that and we helped with the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030. Um, you can see it where it's built into there. You can see the pieces that uh, are targeted at Fortis BC. Um, there's cap on emissions for natural gas utilities. There's um, low carbon uh, fueling and uh, uh, ener electric charging stations, um, energy efficiency pieces. Uh, uh, right in there it says there should be a system that delivers natural gas to homes and businesses. Well, and that system will transition to also deliver cleaner fuels like RNG and hydrogen. And the backstop of this that I think sometimes gets forgotten is that household affordability will be, continue to be a key focus uh, within Clean BC. Um, from that Clean BC, we deliver, we, oh. Um, Mr. Sorry. Weston, could you just slow down? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> just a, a um, tiny bit. It's not I the mean, first time I mean, I've heard that. <laughs> I mean, you get, you know, I'm, I'm pretty leaning up here. 10 to 15 minutes, you don't have. Okay. This isn't public time. It's not three minutes. <laughs> oh, so, sorry. Just, just okay. I'm sort of thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm up here, I'm thinking, wow, my. Thank you. Just because people at home are going to be wondering why it's going so fast, I think. A little yeah, bit, so. I appreciate that. I will slow down. Fully appreciate that. So, again, um, we were part of Clean BC and delivery and and building that program. And from that, I mean, it's a government it's a government thing, so we didn't deliver it. And from that, we wanted to build our plan to match the Clean BC plan. So we developed a clean growth pathway. And we have four pillars to that clean growth pathway. One of them is energy efficiency. It's something we should all start with. It's the, it's the cheapest way to uh, um, be efficient and reduce carbon. Uh, in that way, you know, shout out to the city of Nelson here for uh, their um, latest step codes. And basically that says, build very energy efficient or you're gonna have a low carbon. You have to have a zero carbon fuel. And if you build uh, to a, a step four or step three, I can't remember which one it is, but, but you can have some carbon in your uh, fuel while we work to decarbonize totally the gas station, uh, the gas system. And as well, we've been working with uh, City of Nelson, the EcoSave program, and now the um, what's come out of that uh, to deliver for SPC rebates. And uh, we're 14.5 million um, approved by the commission to spend in 2023 and over the next five years will be 80 million dollars of uh, energy efficient rebates to our customers including customers of nelson hydro uh, we have a renewable natural gas pathway renewable gas pathway i'll say and i'll talk about that more but that's includes hydrogen and other gases we have a zero and lower carbon transportation pathway a pillar and that's uh you know we have 42 uh, charging stations across uh, southern british columbia um, we had 30,000 charges last month, which is a high for us. Uh, we're shooting for 40, we're sure we're gonna hit 40,000 soon. Uh, we, we very much in partnership with BC Hydro, um, the Highway 3 electrification, the Mayor's Caucus of Highway 3, and uh, Accelerate Kootenays, we really pushed uh, uh, 
the electrification of the highway. It's, it's, we were, there's as many EVs sold in the Kootenays as there is in the Lower Mainland. And that's a lot because we built this network. Uh, within this too is some uh, compressed and liquefied natural gas trucking. Um, thanks, lots. Um, so, uh, longer haul trucking, there is no electric solution. There's no zero carbon solution for right now. So, five, ten years ago, we started a project to um, reduce emissions by having uh, trucks with compressed or liquefied natural gas. Uh, it is much less carbon intense than diesel. There's much less particulate matter. And it, and it shows that we need a step sometimes to get to the point of a zero carbon. We need sometimes to have some fuels that aren't carbon free because that's what we can do now in order to get to a, a zero carbon future. Um, the LNG piece is just, uh, it's funny, we le I learned the other day, uh, there's as much carbon emitted to, in the shipping industry to get products into British Columbia annually than there is produced by all of British Columbia annually. So we have a target to um, decarbonize the marine sector by uh, having some LNG to fuel the uh, marine, uh, big um, marine vessels, ships. Uh, so we're working with uh, down the lower mainland with the Muscrim Nation to have some uh, uh, a, a filling station, essentially a jetty, a filling station for LNG. Get nervous around microphones. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, exactly. So here's the energy sector in 2021, uh, 2020, sorry. So you see there, there's a big um, uh, industry and transportation are the biggest pieces of the sector. Um, with housing and commercial smaller than that. And, and that's the left side. The right side is really the important side and, and we'll see it here. So the electricity is the light blue bar and, and electrification policy, um, full on, uh, yeah, this is hilarious, you can't read it. Full on electricity, electrification policy is basically trying to move those top two bars into the electricity bar. and. I ask the question often in rooms, how much, how much energy do you think is given, delivered by the electrical system right now in British Columbia? And the answer is 17 to 18%. It's a very small amount, uh, like, well, compared to how much natural gas and refined petroleum products uh, give. And that's fine, we need to reduce this. There is no doubt of this. Um, but. But uh, so that hydro system is 17 gigawatts of, of capacity, and that's not all that they can deliver either. But Nelson Hydro has a 15, 16 gigawatt capacity, uh, megawatt capacity, but really you're only using nine because you only have the water for nine. So that that 15 is it is uh, that 17 is not all dispatchable. And, and this is so the first issue is around capacity. So during oh, sorry, I'm good. So um, the coldest day of the year in December 2022, um, the hydro system in British Columbia gave out 10 gigawatts of power. The gas system in British Columbia gave out 20 gigawatts of power. And that just for reference, Site C is one gigawatt of power. So, and that took $16 billion in 15 years to make. So how can we bridge this gap if we wanna electrify everything? On top of that, there's a transmission and distribution network that's taken 125 years to build and you know, building that out to move this around, we're finding as Ford SPC Electric is costly. We're having trouble siting substations and reconducting poles and wires. It's not, you can't, the way the system is set up right now, we can't move that power. Um, this, is, this is why we see natural gas, well not, we see the gas distribution network as part of the solution. So we see this infrastructure in the ground that we have as pipes as part of the solution. It's established transmission and distribution system. We have meters and through this we can use renewable natural gases and hydrogen technologies. And relying on a full electric solution will be costly, resource and logistically difficult. Back to clean energy BC and the point on affordability. 
affordability on the electric system is also a problem. We, we've, uh, we recently commissioned a study. Well, we did a study. We filed it with the Utilities Commission so everyone can look at it and have a um, uh, rip it apart if they want. But in order to fully electrify the city of Kelowna, it's $3.5 billion. That's the infrastructure needed to change all the gas to electricity. And, and, and this is an issue. There was another study uh, by UVic in the Lower Mainland that said they need seven site C's to electrify the Lower Mainland. And, and uh, that's not our numbers. By the way, all the numbers that I'm giving you are in the package I gave you as well. So that if you want to look at the data, you can look at the data. So there's, a, a f there's again, there's affordability issue around um, completely letting go of the pipes in the ground. So a little talk about renewable natural gas, which is one of the solutions um, here. Um, so basically what renewable natural gas is, is uh, leaving the carbon in the ground that's still in the ground and using the carbon that's and, and methane that's already pulled out of the ground and taking it from the landfills and taking it from um, cow dung and taking it from uh, composting facilities, anaerobic digestion, and instead of burning it off into the atmosphere, capturing it, putting it in our pipes, and burning it in furnaces. So we've started this program. We're, we're North America's first utility to offer this, and you can see we've, we're doubling our capacity every year to, um, uh, to whatever our 2023 right now. And in 2030, we expect to exceed our target, the Clean BC target of a 30% reduction. And by 2050, we hopefully will be around 80%. Do you have enough renewable natural gas and gases? Um, the province of the Bioenergy Network, as well as Fortis BC, did um, a long-term look at renewable natural uh, gas supplies. And yes, we do. We, we're about 220 petajoules a year. And this is 400 petajoules a year of uh, fuel. Not all of this is zero carbon, right? Like um, there's turquoise hydrogen in here on the left and there's blue. And so there is, like there is carbon attached to that. And there's high energy use attached to green hydrogen, which is at the end. But uh, you, can, you can see it's much less than, uh, there's much more of it than people think. And, uh, and it's available in British Columbia. You know, no, I'll get there. So, so really, we're, we're after carbon here. We're not like, like uh, it's not, um, it's, it's not what the fuel is. Is how much carbon it emits. And this, these are the province of British Columbia's numbers on how much um, carbon CO two equivalents are released um, when, when as fuel. And you can see here that BC Hydro's grid is not, is has three carbon equivalents. Um, that's because they import power from um, other places in order to keep the price down. In the Clean BC plan, there is a plan to says to decarbonize the um, BC Hydro's energy grid. But again, that provides hundreds of millions of dollars to British Columbians through PowerX. So the question here again is on affordability, which is like it, it's everybody's talking about affordability every the price of everything's going up and how we can um, you know, work with that so again decarbonizing the hydro system which is the right thing to do will cost British Columbians hundreds of millions of dollars uh, I don't have Nelson Hydro on here by the way they're like honestly you're around renewable natural gas you're point three um, you're, you're very your lowest uh, in the province because all your generation is green and then you buy 50% from us, which is at that 0.72. So uh, Nelson Hydro's electricity is the greenest in the province. Um, but uh, it's about the same as renewable natural gas. Again, not our numbers. So how can we ensure that uh, Ford SBC can deliver uh, low carbon fuels in our pipes to our customers? We have an application in front of the British Columbia Utilities Commission. It's very important because that means they regulate us. They, they, we have to show them that we're doing what we say we're doing. So we have an application in front that says we, we need to have enough renewable gas to supply 
every new meter that comes online, every new commercial and residential meter that comes online. And uh, uh, it's in front of the commission if you want to look at it. And, and that means immediately going forward, every new connect would be um, carbon free. And, and as we work, we have targets set out as well within it, with it to work behind us and, and keep building the supply behind us as we decarbonize our, our system. Uh, that kind of sums it up. But, but it's, this is, it's, it's funny, like over the last uh, month, two months, I'm glad I didn't put a slide here, because over the last two months, a lot of things have happened uh, in the province. Um, to show us the issues around like full out electrification right now. So um, BC Hydro pulled back its long, its integrated resource plan from the Utilities Commission saying they were through the regulatory process almost saying this thing is useless. Like our forecast from a year and a half ago makes no sense and uh, we need to pull it out and redo it. A lot of this is because uh, of big load sources like Bitcoin, which they've stopped having, um, electrifying LNG. And so like shout out to the Heisla Nation and the Cedar LNG project, like um, getting, um, getting their economy being part of the energy economy that they've been shut out from for 100 years as we built the, built the electric network. They have an indigenous owned LNG project. Um, as well as hydrogen is very energy intense producing hydrogen. Fortis BC's long-term resource plan has just been has just been approved, and we're already well past um, our our forecast as well. And where where we at Fortis, we were a winter peaking utility. Now we're a summer and winter. Like our summer peak last year, 2022, was higher than our winter peak in 2021. And then our our winter peak was higher than our summer, and now we're leapfrogging as air conditioning gets hooked up. Uh, we're working on uh, hydrogen projects a lot, but but uh, we have some small scale demonstration projects and we're working on some bigger ones, but again, it takes electricity to make green hydrogen and lots of it. Uh, so um, to sum up, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the landscape of energy production and distribution and transmission in British Columbia is changing very, very rapidly. And it seems to be a divisive issue. And, and, um, and it shouldn't be. We're very much at Ford SPC. We're, we're, we're open with what we're doing. We show our numbers and we want people um, to work with us to help us decarbonize um, British Columbia. So we don't think it should be a divisive issue. Everybody should work together to hit um, the Clean BC targets and beyond. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, Blair. Um, Council, any questions? Okay, and we've got, um, sure, Councilor Wood. Um, just on a personal level, what would be a couple of things that individuals can do to help this process? It's funny, I'm, I'm like the first thing, I'm, uh, my buddy asked me this, it's hilarious, I said buy less stuff. And he said, what kind of stuff? And I said, buy less stuff, like just buy less things. So, so, and you don't see it, but, but that's what's going on. Just buy, like if the shipping industry is like, like just buy less stuff, you know, and, and, and again, like if, if you're Nelson, participate in the uh, regional district and, and city's energy efficiency program, get the rebates, look at your house. That's, you're going to save money. So um, look at that. Um, that. Those are the two kind of, you know, and, and, and the, hey, the, like the anti-idling by a lot of people, idling, why are we idling? Like that's a, you know, like that's a climate change issue as well. So I, I guess those are three um, quick things. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, Blair for coming in and getting us up to date. And um, councillors, you all have in the full, the full package in here besides the uh, overhead uh, slides, so. Once again, um, thank you, Blair, for, for your presentation this evening. Thanks. You get a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Could have brought those socks. I was going to say leave socks. Keith is wearing got your socks, socks on? Socks for everybody. Oh, he's oh got Keith. His, Keith's got his socks on. Should have brought socks for our...
Everybody in the room. Uh, so I'm a faithful convention man, so I thought <laughs> in, in duty where I'd bring them. <laughs> okay. And our last presentation tonight is the delegation. Let me reset all my clocks and stuff as well. From the doctors and nurses for planetary. I'm um, glad to see uh, Dr. Kyle Merritt and Catherine Ofield here to um, present this evening and to see a full house in the back of many of my colleagues and friends that I worked with for many years at Kootenai Lake Hospital um, joining us um, in the audience tonight. So I'll turn it over to Kyle and Catherine. Well, thank you for having us here tonight. Just curious if the audience could do a show of hands if you're here for our presentation. <laughs> Woo! Woo! You guys did a really good shout out on that email. I saw it. <laughs> thank you. So um, I'm Catherine Oldfield. I'm currently a nursing student. And this is Dr. Kyle Merritt. We are part of the Doctors and Nurses for Planetary Health. We're local, we're nonpartisan, we're volunteers, and we're all health professionals. So health advocacy is actually a part of our professional roles. That includes advocating for the most vulnerable. What is often overlooked when discussing climate change is that the, um, that the most vulnerable, for example, our elders, our children, the unhoused, to name a few, are often the most impacted. Thanks for changing that. So farming, can you do? Um, OK, thanks. We have no conflicts of interest to declare. So you might ask, what is planetary health? So planetary health is the recognition that the services that the planet provides, like clean air, clean water, and a stable climate, are actually the life support systems that are the basis of human health. We know that burning fossil fuels, including natural gas, contributes to the carbon pollution that is warming and negatively impacting our planet. We're already seeing health impacts, even just in our region, from climate change. For example, in the summer months, our patients are suffering from heat-related illnesses and, like, and the many health problems caused by wildfire smoke. This includes respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular disease, and mental health disorders. If you could change it. So we have some take-home points that we hope um, sink in today. First of all, burning gas in the home is detrimental to human health. Additionally, it both directly impacts air pollution and contributes to climate change. Available electric technology is safe, affordable, clean, and efficient. It's also superior to fossil fuel equipment in performance, safety, and efficiency. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so just going to take a minute to talk about what natural gas is. So you know, we're here today because new homes in Nelson are still being uh, connected to natural gas. So of course, natural gas is mostly methane. Um, and of course, that methane in and of itself is a powerful greenhouse gas uh, when it leaks into the atmosphere. And of course, when you burn it, it creates carbon dioxide, which is uh, fueling uh, climate change. Um, the gas we burn in Nelson, uh, which we saw in the previous presentation, is piped down from northern BC. Um, it's extracted there mostly through the process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which has significant impacts to the land and water um, for the people that live in that area. Sorry, I'm working two computers here. Um, so we want to talk a bit about indoor air pollution. So when you burn uh, things in your house, uh, products of combustion are released into the home, um, and these have direct impacts on our health. Um, sometimes the health impacts have been overlooked in the past because the products of combustion are invisible. Uh, we're not always seeing them. Uh, proper ventilation can help with this, and it can be an important part of mitigating the problem, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. You wouldn't idle your car in your living room and turn on a bathroom fan or open a window. Um, and range hoods often aren't properly installed or they're not used during, um, due to the noise, for example. So I know like in our house, we didn't always use it because uh, it was too noisy. Talk about a few of these different uh, pollutants. So nitrogen dioxide is a main one. So this is something that's produced from burning natural gas. It's a respiratory irritant, causes hyper uh, responsiveness in the airways, um, inflammation. So if you're susceptible, it can cause uh, difficulty breathing. I put up some tables here so you can see on the top uh, the national standards um, for what's considered safe. And you can see on the bottom kind of just a regular use of a natural gas appliance uh, can easily exceed those recommended standards. Uh, this graphic is uh, showing the health effects of particulate matter. 
So particulate matter is released during combustion. It's these tiny particles, they're so small, they get into the lungs, they get absorbed into your bloodstream, and then they have all these different health effects. Uh, short term, you know, they can cause uh, symptomatic problems just like nitrogen dioxide, but it's the kind of the like invisible long-term effects that we're really concerned about. So things like stroke, um, heart attacks are all caused by particulate matter um, from air pollution that's being released into our homes. So I actually got, got a sensor and I was using it uh, for wildfire smoke, but then I put it in my kitchen for a while and you can see um, how, you know, when I use my natural gas appliance, uh, you can just see uh, the spikes there where it goes quickly into the red zone, uh, the green bar uh, being considered uh, what's safe. Um, really, this has been studied for decades and there are uh, many studies that show evidence of harm. Um, and this is really kind of consistent with what we know about all of these pollutants that are being released. You know, there's lots of other studies beyond just looking at natural gas about like what are the effects of sulfur oxides, what are the effects of nitrogen dioxide, et cetera, and particulate matter. And then there are also lots of studies that look specifically at natural gas appliances, specifically stoves, because these are open flames that are releasing the products of combustion into the spaces where we're living with our families and our children, where we share our meals. Um, and uh, professional bodies, like we get beyond the primary literature, we start looking at professional recommendations. So both the American Medical Association and the American Thoracic Society have come out with um, statements on this. Um, and even the American uh, Thoracic Society um, going on, if you read down to the bottom there, um, we should be eliminating natural gas hookups for new residential construction. Mm -hmm. Um, so if they're so bad, why aren't they regulated now? Well, again, you know, the products, unlike other uh, combustion that happens, like tobacco smoke, it's invisible. Uh, you often can't smell it. Um, so uh, it's taken a long time for this to kind of come to the fore uh, as a significant health issue. Um, but just like we've had success regulating tobacco smoke, you know, we don't have smoking sections uh, in restaurants anymore. Um, you know, we can do a similar sort of thing where we can protect public safety by helping to regulate uh, some of these dangerous things. A uh, quick note about outdoor air pollution. Um, of course, all of these uh, pollutants are being released outdoors just in greater quantities, and they're having an impact on our air quality uh, in Nelson. And of course, fossil fuels in buildings are driving climate change. So you can see on this graphic that um, for the city of Nelson, 33% of our emissions are from buildings themselves. So if we don't have a strategy to decarbonize our buildings, uh, then we're not gonna be able to meet our commitments uh, that we've made in terms of uh, decarbonization in Nelson. Uh, luckily we have Nelson next um, and this is you know this is obviously in there and it's excellent so uh, you can see down there on the bottom new buildings should be net zero ready. Um, so what about renewable natural gas? Um, uh, you know addressing uh, some of the uh, questions around well can't we just use our existing infrastructure um, and pipe in renewable natural gas, and then uh, that will just be uh, easier and more affordable. And you might be wondering why we, you know, why we're thinking about advocating for electricity rather than using uh, renewable natural gas. So um, it's a complex and very technical topic once you get into the details of what, what is actually meant by renewable natural gas and how that actually be delivered. Um, but generally our group doesn't think it's consistent with a healthy future. In the end, renewable natural gas is still mostly methane. It's methane that's gonna be piped into our homes and combusted in our homes uh, the same way as regular natural gas is. And it's still going to be vented to the outside releasing carbon dioxide. So you're still burning methane, it's, you're still producing carbon dioxide in each every home that has a, has a natural gas hookup, even into the future. Even if you can reduce methane elsewhere, most of this, of course, as you can see on this graph, um, which is a, a Fortis BC um, graph or a, a report that was shared by Fortis, uh, you can see the tiny line at the top is what's like captured from methane in landfills and wastewater and that sort of thing, which is a great idea. Um, but really to produce enough, you've got to get into the hydrogen and the wood fueled gas. So that means like digesting forest materials, whether or not that's chips or trees, but you've got to digest that to make methane to pipe in. Um, and then there's hydrogen. Um, and the problem with hydrogen is you can only pipe in so much uh, you can't just like pipe in hydrogen to our existing system beyond a certain percentage because our current infrastructure can't handle it before you have to build a whole new set of pipes. So hydrogen um, is great, you know, and it doesn't release carbon dioxide, but you can't, you just can't pipe in enough uh, hydrogen into the system that we have. Um, so it's still, again, mostly methane. Um, so like, you know, RNG is not some substance that we can just like pipe in and forget about like the environmental and health impacts of burning methane in our homes. 
Um, whether or not uh, you know electrification is going to be more expensive than trying to <coughs> develop this whole um, renewable natural gas plan of you know creating all the different types of hydrogen and using forest products and building digesters to ferment them into methane, et cetera. Um, I think that's difficult to predict. Uh, what we know about, of course, is like that burning methane is causing health impacts and it's making our patients sick. Um, so. Does RNG have a role somewhere? You know, certainly in existing buildings and in industry and other places, um, but as a rationale to keep connecting homes to the gas network, uh, not sure how that, you know, how that computes. Um, our responsibility, of course, like we're here um, to advocate for the health of our community. Um, Fortis needs new gas connections um, for their business model, right? Like that's how they have to survive as a company. Mm -hmm. So and, uh, why not install clean electric appliances? I'll pass it back to them. Well, thank you. I, I really like that slide that shows that spike in your own home. Um, who here who has a gas stove actually runs their fume hood the whole time that they're cooking? Okay, a few people, <laughs> but you know, not many, because you think you do it just when it smells, not because of the health impacts. So why not install clean electric appliances? Um, in British Columbia, grid electricity is close to zero emissions. 98% of it is generated from clean or renewable resources. The province is also committed to a 100% clean electricity delivery standard that will ensure the grid is zero emissions. Luckily, a wide selection of energy efficient electric equipment is readily available. For example, electric heat pumps provide heat in the winters and cooling in the summers, which also helps us adapt to heat events and smoke from wildfires. Um, next slide. Nelson has a zero carbon step code and we have been following closely the discussions about adopting the next, um, the next level of the step code. So we want to thank you very much for doing that. The challenge of climate change is no longer about the destination, but about the speed. We're in a race and winning slowly is just the same as losing. We need to move quickly on low hanging fruit such as this to be successful. Unfortunately, the provincial plan is just too slow. Luckily, we're ahead of the game in Nelson because of you, our council and staff, you can move much more quickly. So to summarize the take home points again, just like regulating tobacco use as uh, Kyle mentioned, we must take steps to protect the health of our children, our loved ones and the planet from the burning of fossil fuels, including natural gas. Progress needs to be made on all levels and municipal government can make a huge difference. So decarbonizing new builds is straightforward and affordable. We can build on work done in other jurisdictions and new support from the province. Let's have success in this area. Let's use it as a springboard to a bigger work of decarbonizing other infrastructure in town as well. So we wanna thank you. And um, we've covered a lot of ground today. We look forward to answering any questions you might have. Remember, we're health professionals, not energy experts. Um, but we have put together a, li a list of frequently asked questions if you want to look at that. And we're happy to sit here and answer any questions you might have. You might have questions about cost, equity, efficiency and performance, um, grid anxiety, peak demand, resilience, or health. Thank you. Council, do you have any questions? <coughs> really want to. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm going to ask the same question to you that I asked Blair, which is what do you think is the most effective thing that an individual can do right now? I mean, you can agree with what he said. He said basically I totally, buy less. I totally yeah, agree with Blair, actually. I, like, I think that. Um, uh, Buying less is a great way of doing it and thinking of all those upstream emissions, uh, what's called scope three emissions from all the stuff that we buy, uh, the invisible, all the invisible supply chain. Um, totally in agreement with that. And I also, you know, I've taken advantage of rebates to electrify appliances in my own home um, and, and uh, spent a lot of my own money, of course, doing that as well. But I think that uh, trying to encourage people to do those sorts of things. And then back to transport, maybe I'm gonna put in a plug for transportation as well. Uh, to say that um, both public transportation and walking and biking um, are useful things and again have lots of health co-benefits. I would agree with you. I mean, I'm thinking of when people arrive at our meetings, um, 
the ones that aren't Zoom, people walk, they come on their e-bikes, um, you know, different modes of transportation like that. We spend a lot of time at our meetings actually talking about these personal choices. And as much as the personal choices make a difference, really, though, we feel like the chance to come speak to council and, and have a, a larger audience to affect um, bigger change is really important. Um, but the, the little things count as well. Thank you. Good question. Councillor Page and then Councillor Panero. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I actually don't have a question for you. Uh, <laughs> my question is to staff and whether or not, uh, I guess through the mayor, whether this will be on our strategic planning discussions. Um, or do I refer it? You don't have to refer it to strategic planning because I would say this is part of Nelson Next, and I'd say that that's going to be a key component of what we're discussing at strategic planning in terms of the fact that we um, are discussing the anti-idling bylaw. There'll be other things that come from Nelson Next that will be um, discussed in regards to the Nelson Next plan. So all of this is, is in Nelson Next, so it's part of the discussions for strategic planning. Okay. Good. Like timelines and goal setting? Is that what you mean? Because we already have the Nelson Next plan. So then the yeah, next so part would be like... Yeah, what we can get accomplished, like if we can kind of roll it out and see what it looks like. Yes. I like roll out. Um, <laughs> like timelines and goals. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in for that. Oh, my Lord. The pressure <laughs> up here. <laughs> um, pressure. Councillor Panero. Turning up the heat. <laughs> We're winning slowly. Um, so there's a two... Sort of two parters, just for my own understanding. Um, you'd mentioned regulating, or that gas appliances aren't regulated, um, and you sort of made a parallel with smoking and how you know smoking sections anymore, and obviously that's an improvement. Uh, however, people still smoke, and you know they do that. Is there a way to, like, what would regulating? gas appliances look like necessarily like is there a way to burn gas in the home more safely uh, or to minimize that risk and then I guess the other question that sort of plays off the pre it's a little bit strange but the previous presentation um, and in your research and in looking into this what would happen if everybody just went completely electrical right now given that According to some, we don't have the electrical that. So um, how do you see that playing out and, and, and what are some possible you know, um, either solutions or just more like a, a realistic timeline or a realistic way that these two sort of coexist for a while or whatever? Because it just seems like if everybody just, if we walk out of this meeting and the world is different, electrical capacity won't be there to match that intention, right? Um, just a two-parter, sorry. <laughs> just two simple parts. <laughs> Great questions. So, Thanks for the questions, that's awesome. Um, I'll take the second one first, if that's okay. So, um, you know, like, we're not suggesting we, like, go out to wherever the big valve is and, like, turn off the gas supply to Nelson today, right? And then we can just all, like, shiver or whatever, um, light fires in our backyard. It's like, it's all about a transition, right? And so, yeah, we do not have the electric, capability now but like we're not going to build that capability if there's no demand for that so if we keep like installing gas appliances in our homes then where's the demand like people want to build more clean electricity it's getting cheaper and cheaper solar and wind um, we're not going to build you know 19 more sites see dams we're going to be doing this with solar and wind and storage and smart grids and load sharing and demand monitoring and all these new technologies that are going to make electrification um, just way, uh, way more appealing and way more uh, workable than the grid that we have now. So we're gonna have to build a grid and like, you know, the municipality of Nelson is gonna be part of that. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna fix all of the problems within the province of the country and the continent. Um, but what we're talking about is just like, let's not install old technology into new homes that's gonna have to be like removed, you know, however many years in the future before it's end of life because it's emitting too much. You know what I mean? Is that a good enough answer to the second question? I think so, yeah. Okay, we'll take that. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the first question, what we're talking about is like, I guess when I'm talking about regulation and gas stoves, I'm not talking about, um, you know, banning the sale of gas stoves or going into the homes of people and, and, and tearing them out. What we're talking about is just by adopting this um, net zero code, which we sort of flashed up there and I'm sure staff has talked about, 
Um, part of that is decarbonizing systems within the home and making them electric. So then people are not going to be buying gas stoves because they're going to be connecting their houses um, to, to electricity. And then that's where the regulation comes in, in terms of the building code and the bylaws, in terms of decarbonizing the major systems in the house, including heating hot water and cooking appliances. So there's not really a way of... It's, so, like, yeah, sorry, this, the, gas, the second part of the yeah. first question is um, uh, ventilation, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, if the gas stove, if you have, like, a great range hood and you use it every time, like uh, our mayor, then uh, that can really improve things a lot. So if you thought that we could do that and we could, you know, everybody would use their range hoods and we could get range hoods installed in every home, um, that that's going to mitigate a lot of those indoor, indoor air quality concerns. But it doesn't solve them um, because it's still being released. Um, and uh, it doesn't solve the outdoor air pollution problem and it doesn't solve the, the climate problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just just to follow up on that, it's kind of an interesting question because I, in my head, it's like if you're buying those appliances, and I thought that somehow my appliance worked better or more efficiently or burnt the gas more efficiently. I mean, that would be something I would be looking for. You know how we have Energy Smart Index for the fridge. It's like you know, in terms of gas appliances, because I can tell you over my lifetime of gas appliance owning, of which I am a gas appliance owner, um, there has been better appliances and less better. Like, so years ago, I remember the old gas range. You, you knew that a house had a gas range the moment you walked into a, a house. You could you could smell it because there was always some probably small amount of of leakage, right? And I mean, and now it's, now it's better somehow. But I mean, that's like, too bad there wasn't a gas. Like, is it, is it, running hot enough to always be burning as much that you're not, you know, emitting as other particles into the air. But I mean, it still does what it does. I mean, you're never going to, until you don't use it, you're going to be emitting something. So, um, if I may. and I just like, I tell you, it makes me a little bit nervous because I, I, I do like to, to cook and you're not alone. Production's great, Janice. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that's what I that's what I hear, and I know that's where I'm going to next. And so I'm just trying to figure out where I, I'm starting to take measurements. I'm either like, am I buying a gas stove and hiding it, my cooktop, hiding it for when the next one breaks, <laughs> or do I figure out whether or not there's one that's going to fit the spot? But anyhow, um, Councillor Page, you had another question. More of a clarifying comment is around regulation because there's. Uh, is a really salient opportunity too, just in terms of new glass appliances going in and whether they have a vented hood that goes outside or not, because of course a number of mm -hmm. vented hoods don't even, they just recirculate. That's the kind of baseline option you might go grab off a home hardware shelf. And those are things that like, when considering putting new gas appliances in for you know various secondary suites or whatever it may be, if it was more of a requirement from the building inspector that they be vented then you can actually do something, or in some cases, it blows it into your kitchen through a carbon filter, which doesn't mm -hmm. really accomplish anything. But exactly. it's, it's, there's, there's things like that that are easy wins when making those choices. Councilor Payne. I just can't imagine it's not in the building code right now. I'm pretty sure venting to the exterior is in the building code, especially with the new, if you're, if you're building now. So if you're for brand, yeah, for new builds, yep. But yeah, everything needs to be vented outside. I would imagine that's that that is correct, but we don't have no we got we got people from our climate action team here, but we don't have anybody from um buildings, so get answer that question. You're familiar with the building code these days. Anyhow, seeing no further um I have a comment. <laughs> hey. Um it's I have conversations often and I, I sometimes I find it shocking that I'm having these conversations, but I fielded one this weekend where um, some folks were saying to me, Nelson residents, why do we have to reduce greenhouse gases? They're not doing it in other places. We're not <laughs> making a difference. And I just want to say, like, it's, it's hard work what we're doing. And I'm so grateful to see such a large swath of our community here because I know like you're having those conversations all the time with people. I know I'm having those conversations all the time because there's people that still need to be convinced and we have to be careful about like finger wagging and being proselytizing and othering and alienating folks who need to be converted. And so I converted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I just want to say thank you you guys all being here and I appreciate the hard work of our 
six member city staff climate action team and Same. I appreciate the Nelson X plan that came before us so good work all but keep going because it's it's tough work it's not easy I know it isn't and I appreciate it well, like well, thank you very much you have to you have to eat an elephant one piece at a time and this is um, a really large elephant that we're dealing with here so it really is a matter of what we do as individuals but what we also do as a as a group and we've mentioned it um, uh, both uh, Blair and his presentation from Fortis and uh, Kyle and Catherine have mentioned here tonight about the programming and stuff that's available so once again I'm going to um, um, pitch the uh, Nelson EcoSafe program and for those of you that live in the RDCK is to be in touch with the uh, um, REAP program which flows back to the Nelson EcoSafe program anyhow but they are two separate programs depending on where you live and really take advantage of it because um, although we're moving forward I think um, and staying ahead of the BC building code in terms of new bills uh, you don't have to look too far in Nelson to realize that 95% uh, of Nelson is an old build and this is these are really the ones that are need help in terms of um, trying to decarbonize and get things under control so they do benefit from these programs that are in place and a lot of these are also homes owned by those of us those those members of our community that are also at the lower income um, scale if you can afford to build a new one you can probably afford to tweak out some fancy stuff but um, you know this is these programs are excellent for for those people that um, do have concerns about um, about money and where they're gonna get it to do these programs so please check out these programs along with the e-bike program of course so thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you everybody for coming. It's always good to see a full house. And councillors, we have no late items. And so moving on to item number 14. If I could have a resolution to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Woodward, seconded by Councillor Payne. All those in favor? Um, Councillor Page wants to stay the rest of the evening, but that was a big enough vote to pass. <laughs> So we're adjourned.